Hello everyone, Neil here. Welcome to the first video, our maiden voyage and what will hopefully be an adventure into painting technique, at least painting in this series. We're going to get into drawing eventually. Where we're going to start is um, making your instruments. What I mean by making instruments, over the next few videos we're going to construct a value scale, a color wheel, and some chroma charts. The importance of these is uh, if you were to go into a music lesson and never had any musical experience and the instructor was trying to tell you or, or discuss with you the idea of a particular note but you didn't have an instrument handy, be very difficult to understand the note that was being described. So the instruments that we're going to make are going to help you understand the various notes that we're going to be using down the line when we make paintings. Those notes are comprised of what are the three dimensions of color. Right? Anytime you look at a color or think about color, you want to be thinking about three particular things. Value, hue, and chroma. Value is the degree of lightness or darkness compared to black or white. Hue is the name of the color or where it falls in the spectrum of colors. Is it red? Is it blue? Is it blue-purple? Etc. That is its hue, the name of the color or where it falls in the spectrum. And chroma. Chroma is the intensity or the brightness or dullness of the color. So over the coursework and over certainly the instruments that we're going to create here in the next few lectures, uh, we're going to be creating instruments that lay out hue, value, and chroma very clearly. Now where we're going to start is value. Of the three dimensions, value, which again, value is the degree of lightness or darkness compared to black or white, value is the most important of the three if you, you are trying to paint representationally. Because value, controlling the light or dark, uh, um, the lights or darks, is what's going to help you make the form turn. Make something on a two-dimensional surface look three-dimensional. It's all about controlling the light, middle, and dark values, the lights and darks, to make that form turn, to make it look like light is flowing across whatever object you're painting to make it look three-dimensional. So, where we're going to start then is by creating a value scale. Uh, the value scale that we're going to be using, that I use in the, in the studio here at Carlin Academy of Fine Art, is based on the Munsell color system. Uh, that's M-U-N-S-E-L-L -L, if you want to look up the Munsell color system. Uh, the, the value scale is comprised of a total of 11 values. 10 is white, 0 is black, and there are 9 tints or 9 grays in between. So with that said, let's switch to the palette and you can see what materials you're going to need and we can go from there. And there we go. So, <clears throat> what you're going to need, uh, a glass palette um, or some type of a palette. I mean, you could certainly use a wooden palette or a paper palette. I recommend glass because glass is easy to clean. Uh, you can let your paint dry on there overnight. You don't have to worry about it drying on a wooden palette. If the paint dries, you might have a hard time scraping it off without doing damage to the wood. With a glass palette, you can let it sit on there as long as you want, get a paint scraper, and clean it right off, no problem. So <clears throat> all I have here is a, 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 um, a, a piece of glass, an eighth-inch piece of glass I got from Lowe's. I have it taped down to a piece of illustration board and I have a piece of postal paper uh, under the glass. You never want to work on white, on a white surface. The white will cause any value that you put down over to look darker than it actually is. So always make sure you're working on something that is toned. So you want to have at least some type of a palette. You want to have two wooden paint stirrers. You can get at the paint store, Lowe's, hardware store, whatever. You'll notice one of these is painted. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But at least two, so we can make two and have one that we're using and one that sits in reserve and can stay nice and clean. You want a palette knife. The, three, the only three tubes of paint you're going to need for this exercise. You'll need titanium white, <clears throat> ivory black, and raw umber. Doesn't matter what brand you use, I'm using Titanium and Winsor Newton. Doesn't matter what brand you use, the only thing I would say is I would steer you away or, or tell you to steer away from the student grade paints. <clears throat> With Winsor Newton, I know it's called Winton, W-I-N-T-O-N. That's their student grade uh, brand of paint. I would stay away from it. The, the student grade paints have a lot of wax and fillers in them, which make the consistency very stiff. 
and the overall long term, um, the the pigment, the amount of pigment in the paint, because there are fillers added, the pigment is inferior to the professional grade paint. So if you have the money, I'd say stick with the professional grade paints. Uh, so we have titanium white, ivory black, raw umber, and <clears throat> Gamblin's Neo McGilp. Now you don't have to use the Neo McGilp. You could use uh, Gamblin makes Galkid. You could use Winsor Newton's uh, Liquin. The only reason I'm putting this out, you'll see long term, is I'm going to use this to mix in with the paint to not only spread it easier, the paint is, is you know, like toothpaste when it comes out of the tube, but it will also help it dry. So the Neo McGilp I like to keep around when I want things to dry quickly. So that's all you need, paper towels, I mean a couple other things you want to keep around, but and certainly spirits, you're going to wash your brush eventually when we go to paint the... Uh, uh, put the paint on the value scale. So keep some spirits handy, some Gamsol or odorless mineral spirits. But this is what we need to get started. So, <clears throat> let's move these things off of here. And, okay, so we're ready to go. Now, <clears throat> you might be asking yourself, if I'm going to create a value scale of grays, What's the point of having the raw umber? Why isn't the titanium and ivory black enough? Well, the reason is ivory black, again, let's go back to the three terms that we already use, the three dimensions of color, hue, value, and chroma. Hue is the color name, where the color fits in the spectrum of colors. Value is a degree of lightness compared to black or white. Chroma is the intensity or brightness or dullness. If I were to ask most people, and as I usually do when I give this lecture to my students, what is the hue of black, where does it fall in the color spectrum? More often than not, I get the same answer that we were all drilled in, in, in college, in art school, which is black is the absence of color. Well, that's great in theory, but the fact is, is that all tube, um, tube ground or tube mixed blacks fall somewhere in the color spectrum. What makes it difficult to tell where they fall is because the value is so dark and the chroma is so weak that it's difficult to tell exactly where it falls in the spectrum. The uh, black is actually a very dark, very weak intensity blue. And how we know that is if you take black and mix it with any yellow, yellow ochre, cadmium yellow, cadmium yellow light, you will get a very definite green after effect. So that immediately tells you that the black is in the bluish family because, of course, blue and yellow make green. So the reason we have the raw umber available is we're going to be adding the raw umber to the black to cut that bluishness, to neutralize the cool bluishness of the black. The benefit of that is, let's take a situation based on the colors we just mentioned, the yellow, adding black and yellow. If I was painting a lemon, and I was taking that whatever yellow I have available, cad yellow, light cad yellow, etc. And I wanted to darken that yellow to paint the shadow side of the lemon. I could certainly add black to that, just straight black. It would darken the value and it would weaken the chroma of the yellow. However, I would get a, that greenish after effect. It would shift that yellow into the green side of the spectrum as it darkens. Well, if my lemon is not green in the shadow, then that's not really doing me any favors. It's certainly accomplishing some of what I need, but not accomplishing all of what I need. The benefit of mixing this neutral black, which is what we're going to do, well, by combining these, we're going to neutralize the cool blue of the black. By having a neutral black available that doesn't have a cool or warm bias, under that same little setup with the, with the uh, lemon, <clears throat> pardon me, we can take our neutral black and darken that cadmium yellow light or cadmium yellow, add it to that, that color. It will darken that yellow. It will weaken the chroma, but you won't get that greenish after effect. So in, in effect, what it is, as I've heard it termed, is a universal darkener. The neutral black can be added to any hue family to darken the value, to weaken the chroma, but it will not distort the hue. So we're going to be mixing up a neutral gray, or neutral black, I should say, and making our gray scale, our value scale, out of the uh, neutral black and the grays that come from it. So 
first thing we're going to do, the formula that we need to mix, and the important thing to recognize is I can't just mix these one-to-one, 50-50. -one, uh, if it, I'm going to be mixing these at a certain proportion that I've determined where the neutralization is the best. If I just mix these 50-50, because this is more intense than this, the brown will overpower the black, the raw umber will overpower the black very quickly. So I have to mix at a certain proportion so that the two of them cancel each other out and one does not overpower the other. For the colors that I have laid out here, the Windsor Newton Ivory Black, the Windsor Newton Raw Umber, the formula is two parts ivory black to one part uh, raw umber. So that when I'm mixing out my value scale, the first thing I'm going to do is make my neutral black. I'll put it over here in the corner. So two parts, ivory black. You notice I don't have a measuring spoon, set of measuring spoons out. I'm putting two dollops about equal size of the ivory black out and one dollop of the raw umber, about the same size. That's it. Now, you don't have to use uh, raw umber. You could use burnt umber, you could use transparent red oxide, you could use burnt sienna. The only problem or the only thing you need to consider if you do change up the, the colors that I'm talking about here, burnt sienna, burnt umber, transparent red oxide, all of them are more chromatic. They are more intense than the raw umber. So the two to one ratio will not work for those colors. You will probably have to add more ivory black and less of the sienna or the oxide because the intensity of the oxide, the sienna, and the, the burnt umber, it, the, it's more intense than the raw umber, and it will overpower that black quicker. So if you do change to something else, you've got to lay out on a piece of paper, maybe try out some different formulas of black to whatever color you're using to make sure one is not overpowering the other. But we're going to stick with the raw umber and black for this uh, lecture. So I mix out my two dollops of black, one dollop of raw umber, Take my palette knife and mix them together. All right, smooth it out. Pick it up, put it down. Make sure it's well mixed. You don't want to be mixing in, uh, mixing this in with white and find areas where that umber is in its pure state or the black is in its pure state. So we're doing a nice proper mix. Picking it up with the tip of the palette knife putting it down, spreading it out until I'm satisfied it's all mixed. Pick it up, put it in a nice pile. And on the other side of the palette, add my white. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we're basing this, I'm basing this value scale on the Munsell value scale. The Munsell value scale is, uh, as I mentioned before, it is 11 values. 10 is white, 0 is black, and we're going to mix 9 grays or 9 tints in between. Uh, depending on, you know, whatever training someone has come from, I've had a lot of students that have come through that well, I think it's because of they've had some photography training um, where they look at the black is 10, and the white is zero, but that is reversed with what we're doing. 10 is white, zero is black. The easiest way I try to describe to my students to remember it, if you had a dimmer switch on the wall in your home, you would be turning up degrees of light. You'd be turning up to 10 for the highest light. You'd be turning down to zero for no light. So we go up to 10, we go down to zero. So we've got the 10 and the 0. Now we need to mix 9 tints, 9 grays in between to complete our scale. So let me get some paper towel. You'll need plenty of paper towels. We're going to clean off the palette knife, take a little bit of the white. In fact, I'm going to mix it here. I've got plenty of mixing space. Pull out some of the white. Add just a touch, right? We're looking for the 9. So we go from 10 to 9. Add just a touch of the black. Now you notice what I am not doing. I am not scooping. I'm not scooping out of this pile. You notice how I'm drawing from the side. The reason I'm doing that, it gives me a more controlled draw of paint. I guarantee if I scoop paint, 
scoop some of this black, I'm going to get way more than I need. Let me move this up just a little bit. There we go. So I'm taking just a little bit off the side to make sure it's a controlled amount of paint. Mix it. Mix it up properly. Now, the question here uh, that could come to mind immediately is, well, how do I know if this is a nine? All I'm going to do to begin with is I want to get nine tints laid out in front of me. Then at the end, I'm going to show you how to tune and check your value scale to make sure you have evened out the gaps in between. And that's a good value. That's the essence of a good value scale is when it goes from white to black in whatever amount of steps you're doing, in this case nine, and the steps are evenly descending or ascending. They're not bunching up so that you have a whole bunch of dark values and all of a sudden then you have a light value or you have a whole bunch of light values and then all of a sudden you get a dark value. So after I get all nine mixed, I'm just going to make nine tenths. Then I will show you how to go through and tune the value scale to make sure that the jumps between each value are consistent. So I mix a little bit of the gray in or the black in. Take it, drop it into position. We'll line them right up across the top. Get a little bit more white. So I got my nine, my eight, right? Get a little bit more. Again, you notice I pulled from the side. I did not pull out of the center. Making sure this value is slightly darker than the previous one. darker. Drop it next to it. Eight. Actually, just a little bit more. I've been mixing these scales for so many years. I can tell quickly that's not where it needs to be. Eight. So you can see I get a little bit of the white. I'm not worried about the contamination. Now the other thing you notice is I am mixing, putting the white out first and then mixing the black into it. It is always easier and uses less paint to darken a light than it is to lighten a dark. So the only time, more often than not, I will start with the white and introduce the value or long term the color into it. The only time you're going to see me change is when I get down to the values that are closest to black. That's when I will start with the black and add the white into it. But as I'm in the higher values, it's a much more controlled uh, mix of paint, much more controlled amount of paint also, to start with white and mix the black, the neutral black, into it. And yes, for those of you doing this for the first time, this is going to take a while. And that's all good. The mixing process, doing it, you start to get a, an understanding of these values in your head the more you mix them. So that long term, when you've been doing this as long as I have, then the value scale becomes something that you may or may not need to pull out eventually, but you start to burn this scale into your head. The more you mix it, the more you use it. So we have nine, eight, Seven, six, obviously as I move down the scale I'm having to add more of the neutral black into the mixture. Again drawing from the side, not from the center. And who knows, you might be a wacko like me and actually find mixing paint to be quite enjoyable. Very therapeutic. My classes run from 9876 October to May of each year and for many years when I first started teaching what I would spend my first the first week of June after classes ended what I would usually spend that first week doing as almost a little bit of a break from the classes, a way to kind of decompress and get ready for the summer, is I would tube my own paint. And what I mean by that is, let's say I, were gonna, I was going to make up a value scale of grays. 
I would get empty tubes and mix up large piles of this and put them in tubes so that instead of having to mix these, this, this uh, palette out, this prepared palette, instead of having to prepare it every time I went to paint, I had them all tubed. So that was usually what I would do that first week after the semester because I found it very relaxing. As I said, that's what this, what we're doing here is, is what's called a prepared palette. At any given time when you're painting, if I didn't prepare these tints, these grays beforehand, and I just had my white and neutral black, I'd have to be, as I was painting, I would have to be mixing these tints with the brush as I went. A prepared palette is where you take a little bit of time before you start your painting and prepare the values in a logical and sequential scale. So we've got 98765. Again, as I said, grabbing more of that neutral black as I go. Making sure that each pile is slightly darker than the previous one. Moving on through, four, three, don't need much white with that one, a lot more black. And over time, certainly, the more you do this, the better sense you're going to get of exactly how much paint you need at any given time. It's always better, as, I, as I've found, always better to have too much than not enough. It's a rule of thumb. But the more you do it, the more you mix, the more you're going to get a sense of exactly how much is needed in a particular painting situation, and even how much is needed to pick, mix out a palette for the nights or the days worth work worth of work. Nine eight seven six five four three. Now at this point, because I'm getting close to the black, now I'm going to reverse. Now I'm going to start with the black down at the two. Now that I'm at the two, and I'm going to start to add the lighter value into it. So up until now, it's always been starting with the white and adding the neutral black into it. Now that I'm so close to the black, I'm at the two, I'm going to reverse that. Two, and finally the one. Probably have to remix a little bit of the neutral black, but we can get enough out of it to get the one. So just like the nine is just slightly darker than the white, the 10, the one should be slightly lighter than the zero. It might be hard to pick up on, the, up on the camera, but this is definitely slightly lighter than the zero. So now that I have the nine tints mixed out, I'm going to move my, let's see. Move my black, whatever remains. I, uh, the um, neutral black up next to the one, and I'll get some fresh white out here. And the reason is, now that I have the nine tints mixed, I'm going to get the plug-in, the ten, and the zero, so that we can now go through and check and tune this scale to make sure the spacing is proper. And what I mean by the spacing is proper, as I mentioned before, uh, when we're creating a good <clears throat> proper value scale, we want to make sure that the spacing between each values is equidistant, that we don't have things bunching up. And to do that, let's take one second here. I'm going to mix just a little more neutral in case I need it. Neutral black. One, two, ivory black. Two... one raw umber and mix them together. So the way we are going to tune this value scale to make sure that we have equidistant jumps in value is by doing the following. 
So starting at one extreme, doesn't matter whether it's at the 10 or the 0. I usually start at the 10 and move down. Then I'll move at the 0, or go to the 0, move up. We're going to take and isolate the first three values, the 10, the 9, and the 8. Now, when I do this, when I squint, the value that's in the center, in this case the 9, when I squint, should look like it is evenly spaced between these two values. If when I squint, the value in the middle looks like it's buddying up one way or the other, when I mean buddying, it means looks, it looks like it's grouping with one value or the other, then I know that I've got to darken that a little bit. So looking at the three that I have here, the 10, the 9, and the 8, let's move my hand a little bit, it looks as if that 9 actually is, is okay. It is just, and again, maybe the camera can pick it up, maybe it doesn't, it's just a little bit darker than the 10, and it's a little bit lighter than the 8. So if I'm okay there, then I'm going to move down to the next triad and check these. So when I squint, I'm looking now at the 9, 8, 7. I want to make sure when I separate these into this, this 3, this, um, this grouping of 3, that the, the 8 does not buddy up one way or the other. It looks like the 8 is grouping with the 9 just a little bit. So if I see one of these areas where the value is looks like it's buddying up with its neighbor, I'll just pull it out of the line, add whatever amount of the neutral black as necessary. Add just a touch, that's all I need, just a touch to get it a hair darker so it doesn't group with the 8, or the 9, I'm sorry, I'm working on 8 here and plug it back in. That looks better. Again, I know it's subtle. You might not be able to pick it up with a camera, but I can see that this is now, and I'll check it again, that this is now situated nicely between these two. Once I check that, move down to the next triad, right, and do the same thing. Make sure this is not buddying up one way or the other. Looks like that's situated nicely. Move down again. Uh, it looks like we have a little bit of a problem here. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. It looks like the 6 is buddying up just a little bit too much with the 7. It's a little too far from the 5. Sorry, I'm casting a shadow. I'm going to pull this out and darken it up. Pull out that 6 and darken it up just a little bit. And this is how we go. So you're moving from either the 10 down or the 0 up isolating these in sets of threes and making adjustments if and when necessary. A little bit more. Again, draw from the side, not from the center. That's better. Just a little bit more. As I said, the more you do this, the more you will, especially if you take your time, I'm not doing, uh, you'll, you'll be able to hit these right out of the gate. Just a hair. Just a hair more. There we go, that should do it. So, as we move down, we're making our adjustments. Move down, that looks okay, move down, looks like the one, two, three, four, looks like the four can come down a little bit. Now don't hesitate as you're doing this, especially, well it doesn't matter if you're on glass or paper, if it helps to take a sharpie marker and mark the numbers, do it. If it helps you remember which direction, 10 to 0 or even just what the number of each individual value is, do it. Whatever makes it easy to remember, easy to see on your palette, don't hesitate to do it. Yeah, I just need a little bit more. That's better. That's better. Move down. Down. I think the 
glares getting in the way. I'm going to drop the one just a little bit more, and I think the two. Just a slight adjustment. As I said, you just take your time when you're doing it. Isolate three at a time. Bring the two down just a hair. That should do it. Isolate them three at a time. Check your values. Now, once you get all the way down to the zero, yeah, I think now. The three is going to have to drop just a little bit, and that should do it. Once you get all the way down to the zero, going from 10 down, then start with the zero and move up. If you do this properly, check your work, don't rush, then you should see what emerges is a nice, even set of values. And when you do this properly, this tuning properly, you can put a, 10 people in a room mixing a value scale, and if they're all doing this and conscientious about what they're doing, what they will end up coming up with is our value scales that look very similar to one another. So take your time, tune the palette. Once you have the palette, now we're going to paint it, put it down on the value scale, on the stick. And just since I don't believe I've mentioned this yet, this is what is called a string of paint. A string of paint is a series of values of a particular color, light and dark values of a particular color. Now, in this case, we're doing gray, but the word still applies. It is called a string, a series of values from light to dark of a particular color. In this case, we're just doing black and white. So now we can pull out our paint sticks, right? I have two here. I would say do at least do two. That would be easier if you do two. Then you have one clean one that you could sit on the side. Then you have one that you, know, you could be using while you're painting. We're going to be using this to hold up to things, to check values. So it's a, it's a nice little tool that you keep handy, not only to help you mix up your value scale quickly in the future, because what you mix up, you can relate to the value scale that you've already made, but you can also use this to hold up against objects you're going to paint to get a sense of the values that are in the scene in front of you. So. I have an unfinished or a raw wooden uh, paint stick, and I have one that I coated with gesso. You can use either white acrylic paint, or if you want to buy some gesso, go ahead and buy some gesso. This is just a cheap version from Walmart. Um, the point is, what you need is what's called a ground. You need something to go on that raw wood that will create a barrier so that the oil uh, in the paint does not soak into the wood. So the ground, this acrylic layer, separates or coats the wood and keeps the oil paint separate or on top and not soaking in. So I'd say coat both of them with your gesso or your white acrylic. I mean, you could even use matte medium if you have it. Something to create a barrier between the oil paint and the raw wood. Move this one over here. And it's hard, probably hard to tell. I took a ruler once this dried and I measured out 11 inch increments from here to here 11 one inch increments down the stick and that's where i'm going to be adding my values now the only reason i'm going to turn this from left to right is because i paint with my right hand i want to be able to hold this with my left but i'm going to be going 10 9 8 and so on so to help me do that this is where the neo mcgilp comes in handy Put a little glob of this out on the palette. I'm just going to be using this to mix in with the paint to cream it up a little bit, right? If you've worked with oil paint, which is what I'm working with here, these are oil paints, they have a toothpaste consistency. So the medium, in this case, the Neo McGilp number one, will uh, make the flow a little bit, make the paint flow a little bit. It makes it a little more creamier. Number two, it will help dry the paint a lot faster. Titanium white and ivory black are extremely slow dryers. So uh, the Neo McGilp will help not only make the paint creamier so that I can paint it, but it also expedites the drying time. So and handy dandy, right next to me I have a, um, a bucket of Gamsol, which you don't see, but I can use that to clean the paint in between. So take a little bit of the Neo McGilp. Now you notice again, I'm not scooping. 
I'm drawing from the side so that I get a controlled amount. I don't want too much. I want enough of the Neo McGilp. And again, drawing from the side of the paint pile, I want a controlled amount of medium and a controlled amount of paint. I'm looking for consistency that is thin, opaque. It's not toothpaste right off the pile. It's not watercolor. It's somewhere in between. And paint it down. Put down my 10. The consistency I'm looking for, I've got my nice soft brush here, a soft flat. The consistency I'm looking for, I'm sorry, uh, I, when I paint this down, I'm looking for a creamy consistency so that when I put this patch of paint down, I don't get any ridges. If I use the paint straight off the pile, I will get very thick and deep ridges of oil paint. I'm trying to diminish that so that it stays nice and flat. Start with my 10. Clean my brush. Move to my nine. Now the other thing about checking your scale, if you did your job properly, again, pull off the side, pull off the side. If I don't have enough room over here, that's why I'm bringing the paint over here. Drop it down. If there are any inconsistencies after I did the tuning, right, by holding my hand up, if there are any inconsistencies I'll be able to see them very quickly as I flatten these values out and put them on the value scale. So even though you may have done a what you thought was a thorough job checking by separating them into threes, you never know you might find that once you flatten them out on the value scale that uh, some of the areas bunch up, <clears throat> pardon me, bunch up a little too much. But we can address that when we get there. Nine. To the eight, and so on. I can see immediately here that nine might have to come down just a little bit more, but I'll at least get them all painted in before I get too worried about it. So, as I'm trying to keep these videos bite sized, you can see what I'm doing. I'm moving down the value scale, cleaning the brush in between, trying to keep my edges nice and clean as much as possible. Using the Neo McGilp to thin the paint. Moving down the value scale, cleaning the brush in between. When it's all done, I move all the way through. That's what I should have. Right? So as I said, if I am move down, I get all 11 painted in, 11 being 10 down to 0 with 9 grays in between. At this point, once they're flattened out, I can go back again before I clean up the paint and separate them into groupings of 3 to make sure that the one in the center is in fact equidistant from the ones to the left and the right. So this is what we're creating, a string of gray, painting it down on your value scale or on your paint stick. And as I said, I would do two since the paint's mixed out. Um, get them painted. Once they are dry, leave this here. Uh, what I often do is once they are dry and dry to the touch, I will take some pure Neo McGilp, or like I said, if you're using uh, Galkid or you're using um, uh, Liquin, coating the entire stick just with the medium, in this case, the Neo McGilp. I would coat the whole stick with the Neo McGilp because that will act as a varnish. It will create, it's a barrier that protects the paint here so that in the future, if I'm mixing values, I can drop those values right on the stick to check them and clean it off with some Gamsol and it will not dirty up or damage the paint underneath. So once they are dry to the touch, take a little bit of whatever your medium is, spread it over as long as it's a fast drying medium so you don't have to wait too long. Give it one good coat as a varnish, let it dry, and then you're ready to go. So. Get back to me. So there we go. That's at least lesson number one in how to create a value scale. Now the skills that you're learning here 
are important because eventually when we're mixing color, you're going to be, again, you're going to be mixing strings. The one thing I neglected to mention now that I'm thinking about it, uh, just since I mentioned that you're going to be doing this over and over and over again, uh, there are companies and manufacturers that do make pre-tubed value scales. Uh, or I say tubes of, of values of paint. In fact, let's go back to the palette and I will show you. One such manufacturer is, hold on one second, Williamsburg. Williamsburg Paints make an 8, 6, 4, and two values, right? So they, they don't make every value, but you at least between the titanium white and the neutral black that you would mix up, you have eight, six, four, and two. Now the tubes only come in 150 mil sizes, so they're about, I think, 25 to $30 per tube. So certainly you could purchase them, you will use them, um, but if you don't want to spend that money, then you can certainly, you know, it never hurts to learn how to mix a value scale and mix them. Uh, get into that habit of mixing. As I said, the more you mix it, the more it burns those values into your brain. So if you don't want to take the longer option of mixing, you can go with Williamsburg and get their neutral gray, 8, 6, 4, and 2. Also, Gamblin brand makes it's their, their um, uh, Portland grays, Portland gray medium, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, Portland gray light, medium, and deep. The values are equivalent to the por per, uh, um, the Portland Gray Light is an eight value, the Portland Gray Medium is a six value, and the Portland Gray Deep is a four value. They don't make anything darker than a four. So again, you do have options if you don't want to take the time to keep mixing this out. But certainly, the white, the ivory black, and the raw umber are the the at least the most economical choice. And as I said, the more you do it, the faster it's going to get. The other thing I recommend. Uh, is if you do get into string mixing with our prepared palettes, it doesn't hurt, let me grab something here, to invest in a Masterson Stay Wet palette. And what this is, it's actually made for acrylic painting, but it is, it looks like almost like a lasagna uh, Tupperware, where it has a lid, and it's uh, maybe about an inch and a half deep, what I have in here is I have a glass palette in here, so more often than not, and this is what I have my students purchase, is they'll get one of these Stay Wet palettes, they'll put a piece of glass, a 12 by 16 inch piece of glass in the palette, and they'll do their mixing directly on the glass in the Stay Wet palette, so that when they're done their painting session, they can pop the lid on the palette and put it in the refrigerator. The nice thing about that is it will keep the paint wet longer. We'll go back to me. And certainly, after you take all this time to mix palettes, the longer you can keep that paint wet and fresh, that means putting it in the Stay Wet palette or even just putting some saran wrap over it and putting it in the fridge, you're going to get more life out of the palette, especially which is important after all that time you took to mix it. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to leave something in the comments section. If you like what you've seen, like it, share it, subscribe. Uh, with the whole COVID-19 thing, I'm hoping to, you know, instead of putting all this information behind a paywall, to just put it out there on YouTube. But the only way I can do that is if I get feedback and get subscribers. So please, if you like the information, comment, subscribe, like, and share. Thank you for joining me on the first lesson. Next one we'll get into is creating the color wheel. See you soon.